mercy, never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mountain fixed upon it, mount of the Ladies, <laughs> that was a blessing, girls. Appreciate the singing. And that's uh, visiting with them is Mariah Calloway. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's good to see her and Adam. They hadn't, uh, they hadn't been down in a while, unlike what they said. Uh, but <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> Let's get our Bibles open to 2 Peter chapter 3. <laughs> 2 Peter chapter 3. And if you're visiting with us, we're certainly glad you're here this morning. Appreciate you being here, and hopefully we can be a blessing to you. If you've not been at church in a little while, what we've been doing here on Sunday mornings, we've been focusing on the subject of the last days. And it's a fascinating subject in the Word of God. And I, I realize there are some folks here that are acquainted with uh, different facts concerning this event and, and this period of time. Uh, but there are some that are not. And just want to make sure that we're all on the same page as uh, far as what the Bible has laid out for us and what to expect during the last days. And uh, get things set up here. Uh, we're going to look at 2 Peter chapter 3, begin reading there in verse 1. Uh, it says... This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, uh, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. And he says they're willingly ignorant of this, meaning they're denying a whole lot of evidence to reject the light that comes from the word of God as it's presented in Scripture here on this subject. And he goes on to say, but the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word, that is the word of God, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, 
but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief of the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Let's pray. Our Father, Lord, we thank you for the good fellowship here this morning already and for the Sunday school hour, for the songs of Zion, Lord, that encourage our heart, not because of their tune, but because of the truth they convey. And we're thankful, Lord, for the hope that is set before us, Lord, that hope that's a sure, steadfast anchor for our soul, that Jesus Christ, our great high priest, ministers in heaven for us even now. And one day he's coming back to receive us as his church. And Lord, here in these last days as we seek to prepare ourselves, our minds, our hearts to serve you, God, give us what we need this morning from your word. I thank you, Lord, for these that have come out, for these that are, are, are ready to follow you in believers' baptism. And Lord, I don't want to get in the way of anything you want to do here today. And so, Lord, I pray you just give me the right mind and, Lord, guide my words, give me that utterance. And give me that liberty, Lord God. Bear witness to the study, but God, I pray that you'll help me, Lord, to, to think and, and Lord, to, to look ahead and use me, Lord. Help me to have liberty, to, I pray. And God, we thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all sin and for your mercy. And we just ask, Lord God, that you'll dwell with us and you'll meet with us. You'll participate in this meeting. We ask and pray it in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. In a wedding, uh, whenever I, I'm asked to be a part of a wedding there, and I've got to... Uh, kind of oversee the rehearsal. What I do is I, I'll get everybody up here and, and we'll kind of line out to see how, what the a bridegroom and what the bride want for their wedding and uh, how they want it to look one, once we're up here. And when we get everybody in that spot where they're supposed to be, how they want them to be, then we just work our way backwards and figure out now how do we get here? How do we get to this place the way we want it to be set up when we get ready to do the ceremony? And what song is so-and-so going to come out on? And when are they going to light the candles and, and all that other stuff? <laughs> and, uh, and so that's the plan. We start at the finish there and we work our way backwards. And, and that's the way we rehearse there so that everybody understands what we're trying to do. And this is my approach upon the subject at hand as well. And speaking about the last days, I want to establish not just what's going to happen next as far as Bible prophecy is concerned uh, and where we're at in regards to Bible prophecy, but rather, I first wanted to show where things are going to end up and the direction things are going. So understanding the last days, I focused upon the end. Uh, that is the last age before what is known as the day of judgment. And the Apostle John, in writing the book of Revelation, uh, he writes uh, that great prophecy, you understand, not only in the traditional sense of all the Old Testament prophets and the visions that he's given and what have you, but, but if you read carefully the book of Revelation, you begin to realize there that John has carried up into the future and he's shown those things there firsthand so that he can write about those things in the book of Revelation as an eyewitness. And he writes as much as an eyewitness of the events surrounding the second coming of Jesus Christ as he did in writing the gospel of John and the events surrounding the first coming of Jesus Christ. And there were many things that John was able to see that others were not privy to. They didn't get to the, the privilege of seeing those things. At the Mount of Transfiguration he was one of three uh, that was there. At the raising of Jairus' daughter he was one of three that were there. At the, uh, at, at the matter of uh, the Garden of Gethsemane he was one of three that were there. At the cross of Calvary John was the only one that was there of all the other apostles and disciples. He was the one that went all the way. He was an eyewitness of Calvary's cross. And there he was given the, uh, the charge of taking care of, of Mary, Jesus' mother. And, uh, and then of course uh, and later on there as Jesus was resurrected, John also was an eyewitness of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He was an eyewitness of Jesus teaching the things pertaining to the kingdom of God uh, for 40 days following. He got to witness Jesus going up uh, in the ascension uh, there back to the Father to sit at his right hand until his enemies are made his footstool. John was an eyewitness of all that. And then later on in 96 AD there is a much older man. Uh, John is in the spirit on the Lord's day. 
and he is carried by the Holy Spirit to the future there, the day of the Lord. And he writes about those things in its context and, and tells about those things that he's able to see and he's able to witness. And one of which, of course, is the second coming of Christ. And he sees all the way right up to the judgment day as we speak of it. And what he says there about that day, he says, I saw a great white throne and him that sat upon it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. There was found no place for them, and I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And he says, the sea uh, gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That great white throne judgment occurs when time shall be no more. Uh, when it's all over with there, you have this time of judgment. The heavens flee away there from the face of the one that sits on the throne. And those that stand before God there on judgment day, they're going to be suspended uh, before him above that lake of fire. And the only thing keeping them from plunging down into it is the power of God. It's God's mercy. And God there is the only reason they're not going. Now, if you're here this morning and you've never been saved, I want you to understand this. The only thing that's keeping your soul from experiencing that very fiery fate today is the power of God. Even though there's earth beneath your feet right now, the only thing keeping you from dying in your sins and going to hell right now is God's mercy. God giving you opportunity to hear the gospel. You see, you're already condemned if you've never been saved. Already. You're under the wrath of God according to John 3, 36. All that keeps you from experiencing such is God's mercy. You know what you need? You need to be rescued. You need to be saved. Being saved is not a matter of joining a church and getting religious. Being saved is a matter of being rescued. And the Lord wants to rescue today. He'll rescue you by His grace and His mercy because there's a provision already been made through the sacrifice and the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Through the shedding of His blood, sin has been paid for and atoned for once and for all. And this morning, listen to me, you get a bath in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, walk out of here clean in the eyes of God, and your name written down in the book of life. That could be your future, going out here knowing your name's in the book of life and you have everlasting life. God wants to save you. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Listen, one of these days, you're going to stand before God. The books are going to be open. will be cast into a lake of fire. The age before judgment day is the final age of this world's history. Before there's a new heaven and a new earth, and that final age is the kingdom age. And the kingdom age is the heavenly kingdom. The kingdom of heaven coming down here because the king of heaven brings it. And the king of heaven is the Lord Jesus Christ. There is the throne of his glory. The throne of his glory in the city of Jerusalem. There is the throne of his heritage as the son of David. It's the throne of promise. He's been promised this by God and God has sworn with an oath to him uh, that he is going to sit on that throne according to Acts chapter 2 verse 30. And last week we seen, we took the time here and seen reference after reference beyond any shadow of a doubt according to the Bible. Christ will come to this earth again. That's what the Bible says. He will come and he will reign from the city of Jerusalem over the land of Israel and over all the nations of the earth. That's what the Bible says. There may be some that you were raised to believe just what I said. And there may be others that you were raised to believe just the opposite of what I said. That's irrelevant. There may be some you have an opinion uh, different from mine and you have an interpretation different from mine and that's irrelevant. One thing that we can all agree on, if we're honest, is that this is what the Bible says. Now you can say, well I don't believe that, that's another issue. <laughs> You can say, well, I've got a different interpretation. That's another issue. But one thing, if you're honest and you know how to read, you have to say, this is what the Bible says. Jesus Christ is coming to this earth again. He's going to reign from the city of Jerusalem on the throne of David there over all the nations of the earth. Now you say, well, I don't believe it. That's okay. That's your right. You don't have to. We're not going to force you to. We're just saying this is what the Bible says. And we took the time last week to look at all the references and know that that is what it says. And here in 2 Peter chapter 3 is a reference to the day of the Lord. 
2 Peter 3 is talking about how this one day is as a thousand years. And that's all, of course, insight to the binding of Satan there. He's going to be bound in that bottomless pit for a thousand years there uh, involving Christ's kingdom. So just as I was saying there, talking about starting at the end there and working our way backwards and showing how things end up there. In the end, friends, and this is exciting to me, uh, the Son of Man is going to return in His glory. And every eye in the whole wide world is going to see Him in His glory, in His kingdom. And listen, those who pierced Him and those that have defied Him and those that have rejected His gospel, they're going to know they're in trouble to the point of they're going to be wailing because of Him. The heavens are going to open. The skies are going to be filled with His saints and with His angels there. And He's coming in great power and flaming fire, taking vengeance upon His enemies. That's what the Bible says. And then from the throne of His glory, all nations are going to be gathered before Him. And listen, He all by Himself is going to determine which nations are going to enter into His kingdom and which ones are going to be destroyed. And the day of the Lord is as 1,000 years. And that day, listen, listen, that day is going to, at the end of it, when it's over, all the elements are going to melt away from the face of Him that's going to sit on the throne. And there's going to be a great white throne judgment. But know that right now, in regards to the ages, it's all being funneled down to the period of this kingdom that I'm talking about, and that's the way things are going to end. Now, uh, before the nation of Israel is going to be of a mind to receive their Christ, to receive their Messiah as their king, they're going to go through the worst period in all of human history, uh, particularly the final three and a half years known as the Great Tribulation period. And what that's going to serve, the purpose it's going to serve is going to be to purge Israel, the house of Israel there, uh, right down to what the Bible calls a remnant of people. And a time of great tribulation is going to come even to chasten the nations uh, for all their rebellion and for all their unbelief and their mistreatment of the Jewish people. That time of tribulation is coming. So again, there's the kingdom. This is where everything's going to end, the kingdom. And then before the kingdom, there's the tribulation period. All right? Now, understand this. Today, we're not in the tribulation period. And we're sure not in the kingdom. <laughs> we're not in the tribulation period. We're not in the kingdom. We're in something we refer to as the church age. Right now, this is a, a special time, the day of salvation. And the Lord is forming the bride there by the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And that's what's taking place. As we look at the Bible, at the subject of the last days, there are times there we've got to understand in this context because it might be talking about the last days of the age that we're living in right now. Or it might be talking about the last days, the last days of the leading in towards the kingdom. But the subject of the last days... Uh, it, it's something to be distinguished. And we'll get into that and we'll develop that as we go along. But right now, at this day and time here, this isn't the kingdom. This isn't the tribulation period. This is the church age. And we'll talk more about the uh, last days of the church age as we go along. But, but know this. Here in 2 Peter chapter 3 is the last time the phrase, the last day shows up. The first time it showed up, we looked at last Sunday morning. Genesis chapter 49. Genesis 49 is the first time the, the phrase, the last days, is mentioned. And from that I introduced this thought of God's perspective in all this. And the thought was how that in the beginning, God told us about the end. And that shows you the, the subject of the Bible. And I didn't have time to really finish that thought. Now, I'd like to continue on with that today, get you thinking about God's perspective in all this. So, uh, go ahead and you're on this end of the Bible. Turn to the book of Jude. Have that ready to go. And then also I want you to get the book of Genesis. Get Genesis chapter uh, 5. Get Jude in Genesis chapter 5. And it's a wonderful fact that in God's book of the beginnings we're shown the end. And the, the first time again the phrase showed up. It was in Jacob's prophecy in Genesis chapter 49. And uh, how that throughout all that is he prophesies of his sons, the sons of Jacob. And he talks about the tribes that overwhelmingly he's pointing towards uh, the Holy One of Israel that's going to come. And the star of Jacob. And the Lord Jesus there were given information about him in both the first and second coming as the lamb and the lion and as the shepherd and the stone. And Jacob, he tells his sons that that information he's given them was about the last days. Now imagine again, in the first book of the Bible, the book of beginnings, 
We're given information about the last days. Again, showing us ultimately the author of the Bible, and I mean all 66 books, is omniscient. He's omnipresent. He's all-powerful, self-existent, the God of heaven and earth. And, and those attributes I just threw out there, those are the incommunicable attributes of God. Meaning, we can't communicate them to each other. Uh, we, can't, we have nothing to compare those attributes to. There's no way to speak about omniscience today intelligently. There's no way to speak about omnipotence today intelligently. There is nothing that we could compare the Lord to. There is no one we can compare uh, the Lord to. He's so high. And, uh, and think about it this morning. Think about the word here. The word here. Where is here to you? Where is here to you? If you had to define here, would you define such as being where you are? <laughs> that would be the way we would define it. I'd ask, where is here? And you say, it's here. <laughs> and I'd say, well, okay, where am I? And you'd say, you're over there. <laughs> And that's the way we think, right? Amen. And then think about the word now. How would you define now? You'd say, well, now is in the present. Now is the present, right? Well, I mean, what was yesterday? Yesterday was the past. Uh, what will tomorrow be? Tomorrow will be the future. Now to you and I is when we are. And here to you and I is where we are. That's the way we think. I I'm reminded of a, of a preacher that was met by a arrogant young man and he said what if I thought I was God and the whole world revolved around me what would you think about me and the preacher said I, I think you as a, a typical normal young man <laughs> and there's a lot of truth in that folks <laughs> there's a whole lot of truth in that a lot of folks have a life perspective that is just assuming the role of the Lord in their own universe it's like during this great big movie and the movie's about them of course <laughs> and everybody else is just you know supporting actors. And everyone there is just about his story or her story and everyone's thinking about them and talking about them and looking at them. That's in their mind. And even as they entertain the thought of God in heaven, what is his role in their movie? <laughs> it's to please them. <laughs> That's to make them happy. You understand? That's the way a lot of folks think about it. But now think about the true and the living God today and how, how he would define here. Where is here to the Lord? And where is now to the Lord? Biblically speaking, right? <laughs> what a thought, huh? God is omnipresent. The eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. He fills all time. He's the everlasting to the everlasting, the eternal God. We're not just talking about someone who is, who is you know, a during time. Someone who was here, and he's still here, and he's going to always be here. I mean, from our perspective, that's the Lord. He is, and he was, and he always shall be. That's our perspective. That's a fact. But from God's perspective, folks, he is. Period. Amen. Hey, when God glories in who he is, he says, I am that I am. Amen. That's him. God doesn't glory in who he's not. God glories in who He is. And He says, I'll tell you who I am. I am that I am. God help us. I mean, in this day and time with all this watered down religious contemporary movement, Amen. folks want to try to dress God up so as not to offend this sinful, wicked generation. Not talk about hell and damnation or the sinfulness of man in the sight of God. Let me tell you the truth. God is angry with the wicked every day. Amen. And He has a right to be. Because He's God. There's nothing wrong with him at all. He is light and in him is no darkness at all. Our God is a consuming fire. You know where here is to him? It's everywhere. You know where when is to him? It's all time from everlasting to everlasting. That's where it is. Now you think about that. Think about he speaks to Noah, Noah about now. He speaks to Moses. He uses the word now. When he says to us now, it's not the same as when he's talking to them. But God's above it all. He supersedes time. He started the beginning. He'll finish the end. He's before all of this. Now, when he uses a man to record the future from our perspective, and keep in mind, he's in the future. Amen. Right now, that's where he's at. He's in the present right now. 
He's in the past right now. When he uses a man to write about the future, that prophecy that man's writing about is simply pre-recorded history. It is history before it happens. And to illustrate this, we got the book of Genesis. The book of beginnings. And in the beginning, God tells us about the end. And there's no way it's going to change. It's going to happen just like God said it's going to happen. He's already there. Amen. He can take a man out of his time and show him the future and then put him back in there and say, write about it. That's what he does with Isaiah. That's what he does with John in writing the book of Revelation. He's outside of time. That's our God. And here in Genesis chapter 5, verse 21, it says, And Enoch lived sixty and five years and begot Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begot Methuselah three hundred years and begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were three hundred sixty and five years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Now when it says God took him over there in Hebrews chapter 11, that's defined for us. Let me read for you. Hebrews 11, 5 says, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. You know what God did? God took him from earth to heaven. God took him so that he wouldn't see death. Now look at Jude. I told you to get that. Look at Jude and look at verse 14. Jude verse 14. And the record of Enoch there is in Genesis. And Enoch is a preacher. And look what it says in verse 14, Jude 14. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh, notice, with ten thousands of his saints. Now, folks, you're looking at that. Let's use some discernment. We were teaching about this morning in Sunday school. Is that the first coming or the second coming? That's the second coming. <laughs> Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. So over 1,600 years before the birth of Christ, <laughs> right? over 3,600 years ago, Enoch's preaching about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And about his second coming, he says in verse 15, to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among all them of their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Here's Enoch. He's, he's only the seventh from Adam. I mean, folks, you, you may not realize this, but Enoch's so close to the beginning of things, relatively speaking anyway, that when Enoch's born, Adam's still alive. <laughs> what, what a thought. They didn't have the Scripture, but they, imagine what a testimony Adam carried with him, huh? And he's around during this time that Enoch is born. And Enoch's the seventh man from him. And even from this Enoch, again, well, he didn't have the Scriptures, but you know what he had? He had light from God. God communicated to him His message, and this man was faithful to give God's message to others. And what, what was that message? It was a warning. It was a warning. A warning about the upcoming judgment of God. In that message, he preached about the second advent of Christ. And folks, listen, just, just a few hundred years <laughs> after Enoch, you got another man showing up named Noah. And Noah spends 120 years preparing the ark. Why? Because God's judgment's coming. And it's coming in the form of a flood. And that universal flood that was going to crush the life out of everything that lived. And I know this is hard for this generation, but God was going to send it. Okay? Well, he just killed the service today. Let me just repeat that, okay? God was going to send this flood. And it was going to destroy the world. And now, here's Enoch preaching before that ever happens, warning about that judgment that's coming. And it has application, but it's not the fulfillment. The fulfillment is the second coming of Jesus Christ. And that's the way the Bible's written. You know what God will do in the Bible? He'll prefigure the coming Antichrist and the United Nations, the final Gentile kingdom in this world, he'll prefigure them by historical figures like Sennacherib and the, the Assyrian invasion on the northern kingdom of Israel, or Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian invasion on the kingdom of Judah. He'll use historical figures like Alexander the Great in the book of Daniel and the Caesars of Rome. And he used that history to sort of frame the ultimate fulfillment you know what Hitler was? He was a forerunner. Antiochus Epiphanes, he's a forerunner. You know who the fulfillment is? 
It's the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, and the mark of the beast. The Bible tells very clearly about all those things that's coming on this earth. I'm glad I'm not going to be here. Amen. I'm glad the Lord's coming for the church before that ever happens. But this is the way the Bible's written. And here's this message of judgment. It's being preached by this preacher named Enoch, and he's a second coming preacher. Before Noah ever shows up, he's preaching about judgment. Only he's not talking about the flood. He's not talking about the flood. He's talking about the return of the son of David, Christ Jesus the King. That's what he's preaching. And folks, he's preaching that before the Lord ever came the first time. Before he, thousands of years before the Lord was born, he's preaching about the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's the emphasis of Bible prophecy. I wonder who gave Enoch that message. <laughs> I, wonder, I wonder how Moses knew that that's what Enoch was preaching. I wonder how Jude in the New Testament knew the details of what Enoch was preaching. You know, the answer is, I am that I am. He told him. <laughs> he filled them in. Amen. <laughs> because he's, that's him. Right here is all time for him. And he's looking at it all at the same time. I am that I am gave the message to Enoch. And folks, listen, I mean, there's a lot to say this morning. We don't have time to say it. But people didn't like Enoch's message. <laughs> people don't change. And they don't want to hear about these ungodly sinners and ungodly deeds and this judgment. Come. People don't want to hear it then. They don't want to hear it now. But you know what? Enoch didn't care. <laughs> He's a was not, amen. And when it came to what he was preaching, he was not amen. guessing. <laughs> he was not without light from God. He was not without authority. God had given him the message that he was to preach. And about the people there and their appreciation of the message, that didn't matter. That didn't matter to him. He would preach because he was not in fellowship with this world. That's Enoch. He was different. You know who gets offended when you preach against the world? The world. <laughs> and when Christians get offended because you're nailing the sins of the world, they're on the wrong side of the line. To be, friend, to be friendship with the world, the Bible says, is to be enmity with God. My goodness, we, we're in such a day and time where everything's so mucked and mattered and gray and people don't read the Bible. They don't even know what I just said is true. But the friendship of this world is to be at enmity against God. And you know what? Enoch, he was not a friend of this world. God's was not was not a friend of this world. Enoch was not ashamed to speak up for God. Amen. He wasn't ashamed to speak up for God. Again, God, he glories in who he is, not in who he's not. But with Enoch, the fact of what he was not shows us what kind of person he really was. And Enoch was not ashamed to testify, to speak up for the Lord, to tell it like it is. He was, not a, he was not afraid of persecution. We talk about the last days. Here's the truth for you, whether you'll have it or not. 2 Timothy chapter 3 says that they which live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. There are going to be someone talking. There are going to be critics. There are going to be those that oppose those who live godly in Christ Jesus. Not a conspiracy theorist. Amen. I'm not a chicken little. The sky is falling. I'm a Bible reader. And I believe what I read. And it says, They that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Enoch had his share, but didn't bother him. He was not ashamed to speak up for God. He was not afraid of persecution. I'll tell you something else about him. He was not afraid because he was not alone. <laughs> He was not alone. He walked with God. Friends, when you walk with God, He walks with you. <laughs> Here's a real was not, amen. <laughs> he was not ashamed. He was not afraid. He was not alone. <laughs> and He was not affected by His surroundings. He was not conformed to this world. Something else about Him, He was not one to doubt. He walked with God and He did so by faith. Truth is, the Bible says, without faith it is impossible to please Him, for he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. That's what the Lord wants. He doesn't want us just to try to put Him in every now and then and fit God into our life superstitiously. He wants us to diligently seek after Him. 
to pursue after God. That statement is made in Hebrews 11.6. Hebrews 11.5, it's talking about Enoch's faith. He had light from God. He had communication from God. And then once he was translated, Enoch was not found. And he was not found because he was not lost. <laughs> Enoch was not lost. God took him. God took him. You know what we're talking about, folks? I've got to wrap this up this morning. We're talking about God in the beginning telling us some things about the end. And Enoch was somebody, he didn't have to go through the flood. He didn't have to go through that period of God's devastation. You know what the Lord did? The Lord took him. It's a picture of the rapture. What we call the rapture is the calling up of all of God's saints. If Jesus were to come today, every one of us that have the Holy Spirit inside of us would be changed. In a moment, the twinkle of an eye, and at the speed of light, out of here we'd go. <laughs> There's some things that I've wondered about and questions I've got about the tribulation period and different things and how that thing adds up. And I've got some questions and I don't have it all nailed down. But one thing I absolutely know, not one second of it has anything to do with me. It has nothing to do with the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're in the last days of this age, amen. And in the last days of this age, when it's all over with, there's going to be a lot of was-nots. You got astronauts and cosmonauts. One of these days we're going to be was-nots. <laughs> and we're going up here at the speed of light and we're going to be with the Lord. I hope you're ready for the trip today. Enoch was not ashamed. He was not conformed. He was not afraid. He was not alone. And he was not found because he was not lost. If you're here today and you've never been saved, that's exactly what the Bible says about you. I don't say that because I don't like people. You know me, you know that's not true. I don't say that because i got an axe to grind against people. But the Word of God says you're lost to God. You're separated. You know what you need? You need to be found. And the way to be found is to look up and to trust His mercy and His grace and call upon His name the Bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There is one Savior. He came into the world to save sinners. Today if you realize you're a sinner and you need to be saved, look to Him. He's your answer. He died for you. He was raised again. He's coming back one day. If you're not saved, you're not ready. You're not ready. I want to ask you to bow your heads every body in a state of prayer. Amen. Thank the Lord for Ashley coming to be baptized and follow the Lord in believer's baptism. And she was saved when she was 12. And the Lord's been doing a lot for her lately and she's thankful to be a part of the church and just loves junior church there and Brother Jack's ministry. And we're thankful for Brother Jack and what he does there with the youth. And uh, based upon her profession of faith, in the Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize this my sister in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. All right. And here on our youth night here the other night, uh, Shannon came to get saved and I uh, came forward, I was preaching, I don't even remember what I was preaching on now. <laughs> That's not what's important, amen. And the important thing is he came to get saved, and Brother Jack led him to Christ up here on the altar, and he knows if he died today, he'd go to heaven. He understands what this is a testimony of, that he's through the world, and he's going to follow Jesus Christ, amen. You all remember this young man as he follows the Lord. Based upon his profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize this, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Brother Dickie and I was talking about him getting in church and he's
just feels like he's just always been here. Amen. Amen. He really does. And he said the same thing. And he's glad to be a part of the church. And one of the follow the Lord and believers baptism was saved at 15 years old. Dickie, is that right? right. And he knows he's going to heaven when he dies. Amen. He's glad to follow the Lord. Said he got out of school. He said, I don't know what happened to me. But he's, he's, he's glad to be going towards the Lord now. And we're glad that he's going to be serving the Lord with us here. Amen. Based upon his profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize this my brother in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Amen. 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 All right. Let's... Let's stand for prayer.